up. I want to say thank you to everyone who you know, made this uh, wonderful thunderstorm on this pretty summer evening. Um, it's a real privilege to read at the Pen and Pencil Club and read by friends. So first poem I'm going to read is, um, it's actually what I wrote after the first of Stu's readings that I attended in Westchester. So uh, Stu's reading, I hadn't been writing and reading in a while, and um, so this is kind of like a return to poetry for me. So Stu's reading takes place at Barnaby's in Westchester, and at the time his students were in the crowd, so they make a little bit of a cameo in his poem. So this is the poetry of it all. Poetry of it all. There's poetry in all of it, you tell me. In the drunken shouts emanating from the fantasy football league in the bar below the poetry reading, where words fly and spark in the humid late summer air. There's poetry in the way you hold my hand on the way back to the car, in the way that the light slants through the front window and catches the azure waves of the glass vase on my desk, in the rhythm and the, cl the clicking of the keys as I type this poem, in the pure, unabashed joy with which the dog rolls around on his back small toy held in his squat paws, calling me out to play in the most human and primal of voices. Thank you. This poem is called Wildwood. This is for my dad. It's his birthday on Tuesday, so happy birthday, Dad. Wildwood. He used to call me his champ when we used to walk along the beach in the early morning wildwood sun, looking for mussel shells and anything else that glimmered just under the sand surface. My jeans rolled up into what he called clam diggers. He held my small hand in his large, warp calloused one, matched my, his long stride to my little girl-sized steps. Later, as the days grew warm, he would toss me laughing into the shallow, lapping waves. I was always a little scared, knowing I could drown if I weren't careful. I have forgotten that feeling, but what remains is the weight of the dusky water pooling around us, and my father's strong tanned arms holding me aloft in the pool of the waves, filling the grit of the sand and broken shells beneath our wet, salt, sticky feet. We're the lucky ones, I tell him now. We found our way back to each other across life's shell-crusted, wind-swept beach. Okay, so this one's kind of a weird one. Um, I was taking classes, uh, pottery classes at the Chester County Art Association, and a couple weeks in, um, I found out that the kiln technician had died in a fire. Um, I didn't know her well, but it, it felt like a moment that should be remembered. So this poem is called "Elegy for a Stranger." Elegy for a Stranger. Nita died in a house fire. I barely knew the woman whose hands held these, her glazes, her tools, her unfired pots scattered around the studio. The fire must have been hot, as hot as the kilns she used to fill and unload week after week, year after year. It's tragic, of course, that goes without saying. But it's beautiful, a life well lived, at the end, her body crumbling, a pot unfinished, fired by the heat, turning hard and vitreous. A life began as art, ended as art. And while we're sticking with poems about people who are uh, no longer with us, this is a poem I wrote for my grandmother, um, my nonna. She is Italian, didn't speak English. Um, my family came, my mother's family came here in the late 60s. And um, unfortunately, nonna had a really hard life. So I found out, I was told for death, and uh, sort of a homage to her and, and the time we had together. She loved books, she encouraged me to write. So. This is a requiem for Nona. I dreamt last night that we were stuck in Castelbono, the Sicilian inferno where my Nona, your husband, hurried around like a bantam rooster, like he was the definition of the American dream come true. In that awful village, it was always too hot, and there was never enough water to shower, and your in-laws spoke a dialect of Italian incomprehensible to both of us. And the widows in black lace gathered on the corners like a murder of crows. You were judged with every stare when we walked the broken cobblestone streets. To pass the interminable time together, excuse me, to pass the interminable time, we read Anna Karenina together. The length of Anna's suffering comparable to the long, 
light-filled, livestock-scented days. I'm not smug enough to believe in an afterlife, even though I pray I'm wrong. And if I am wrong, I hope that there are plenty of long books for you to pass the eternal time, that the roses you loved unfurl their skirts of petals around you, and that the word depression is finally freed from its earth and shame. a summer poem. Uh, I wrote this last summer watching several Olympics, not enough. On watching Michael Phelps swim in the 2016 Summer Olympics. He strikes the water with arms close to his body, fluid, purposeful. The turquoise pool froths around him as each stroke hits the water, arms pumping, legs fluttering. Long line, brown seal, pushing forward, always forward. It's effortless, or it seems that way at least. It's the same with art. You make it happen, and it's as if the words spew forth of their own volition. Images splatter onto the canvas by themselves. No one sees the hours alone. For Phelps, in the pool, at dawn. For others, dark hours. The computer screen, glowing like an otherworldly orb. The tapping of the keys, the only sound in the room. Next poem is called Maya, uh, which is the Sanskrit word for illusion, um, or the word, but it also describes the, the world we live in in um, Hindu mythology. And it starts with a quote from Bruce Lee, one of my favorite philosophers. You must be shapeless, formless, like water. When you pour water in a cup, it becomes the cup. When you pour water in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. When you pour water in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Water can crash. Oh, excuse me, water can drip and it can crash. Become like water, my friend, as Bruce Lee. Synapse is sparking all the time. Turn off the mind. Empty yourself like a flowing vessel. Turn off the mind. No, control the mind. You'll control yourself. It's hard to pause in our non-stop, non-stop, non-stop blinking, ad-driven way. Where everything's a little too fast, always a little too bright, a little bit out of step. How do we stay in touch with what we can't see, with what's buzzing inside, humming in the distance, just out of reach? So this next one um, <coughs> by Anthony Chaucer. We were watching The Walking Dead, and Ancient Aliens was on the History Channel, as it seems to be every time I channel start anymore. So this is a short one, and it's called Creep. We create grotesque monsters, shambling zombies, werewolves morphing in the middle of the fields, aliens building the Egyptian pyramids. Is it because it's easier to create mystical illusions than to face the darkness inherent within ourselves? So, this poem is called Vignette. Um, I wrote this at my local Starbucks. Vignette. They sit quietly together, a quartet of young, brown-skinned, bearded men, sharing coffees and pastries at my local Starbucks. Speaking Arabic, their words shushing to their way into a conversation together, punctuated by raucous laughter, eye-rolling, and jokey smiles, against an incongruous background of American soul music. Hold on, I'm coming. But what are they talking about? Family, work, women, Home, but is home here or there? Language is universal, transcendent. On the subject of um, people coming to this country from foreign places, uh, this is a poem I wrote inspired by recent troubling events. Uh, it's called Keep Away. We're building walls, we're kicking them out. The people who made the mistake of coming to America. This America, for a life better than what they left over there. Talk of visas, K1, H2A, TN slash TD. It sounds like a virus, the virus of putting America first. So we've tried this once before, at terminate camps, travel restrictions. It didn't work then, it won't work now. The melting pot is starting to burn. So. 
this is what I wrote last year. Um, I used to work for a vocational rehabilitation company, and this is one of the results of that. So. This poem is called Workers' Comp Blues. They walk into the union hall, the courtrooms, pleading accidents, describing what they used to be able to do before, but can't do now. I used to lay bricks as a master mason. I used to be a plumber, a roofer, a machinist, a longshoreman. But all that's gone now, since the accident, since I lost my hand, since my back gave out, since my knee stopped working. And my wife's gone, the bills remain unpaid, and my lawyer will take 25% of whatever I get. If I get, that is. And the union, the boss, the insurance, the company doesn't want to pay. Even though I left more than my fingers in that machine, broke more than my back on that job site. How do I make the workers' comp doctor understand that my soul is what cracked the day I fell? And there's no physical therapy to fix that. Thank you. All right. So this is a poem I wrote a long time ago in college. Um, it's about poor Jim Morrison, I love the doors, specifically Jim. So this poem is uh, incorporates some of Jim Morrison's and the doors lyrics inside. So can't claim credit for all of it. Um, but this poem is called Morrison's Good Friday, and I actually wrote it on a Good Friday uh, years ago. Morrison's Good Friday. Did they ever know about your suffering encased in Lizard King leather pants? You never let anyone in on it, deciding instead to play Nietzschean mind games with the audience. Or maybe you did leave clues around, hinting at your distress, but we didn't bother to notice. Maybe your screams and writhing on the stage weren't out of a rock star poet's desire for the limelight, but instead the cathartic convulsions and thrashing of a soul lost in the gold mine of suffering. How could we know of the tumult you were engaged in? Your family, rigid in your dissatisfaction, your struggle in attempting to face a world changing in myriad directions. Circles round the desolation of young men slumping off to Nam. You stumbled constantly consistently alone. On this gloomy Good Friday, I honor your struggle that ended in a lonely bathtub in Paris. Was the water cold? Did death come and take you gently to meet the Indians lying on dawn's highway bleeding? I won't visit your grave in Père Lachaise Cemetery. I won't leave condoms, whiskey, or cigarettes there. But I write you this poem instead, knowing you, who love the written word, and who long to be taken seriously as a poet, would understand. Okay, I'll read this next one. This is uh, about the same time I wrote that one. And uh, this one probably a bunch of the features of famous people, but um, this one is uh, much as I was having my, and it was having my work on Friday. So uh, this poem was inspired by moving, which is my least favorite chore in the world. Moving. Wasn't it Hemingway who said people don't change, only locations do? He would have known, expat that he was, traveling from one dive cafe to the next, in one lost city after another. But I can't picture him carefully sealing these boxes shut, marking them fragile, while I'm what the way I am tonight, while you're at class. Now I get the impression Papa traveled late. I leave Hemingway to the big cafe in the sky as I pack away our kitchen wrapping it all in the same three copies of the Philadelphia Inquirer, Mayor Nutter's face staring back at me disapprovingly. As I seal the last box, I think of Hemingway and poor Hadley again. Hemingway faced his own brokenness every day and wrote about it, the great grace, the way boxers would stand a broken nose and take another punch. But you and I, we're not like that famous couple. Writers both. Our lives lack the glamour of Pernod and lost cafes, but we're not broken. Um, this is a new poem. This is a poem I wrote a couple weeks ago when it was blisteringly hot outside and I was hanging outside on the patio with my dog. So, um, this poem is called Summer Idol. I was sitting on the chase lounge in the backyard behind the tomato plants, a dog on the grass next to me, his tongue lolling out of the side of his mouth in the evening heat, his tail a slowly flapping flag. A mosquito the size of my thumbnail crashed against my head, like a low-flying plane buzzing a field. They're bigger out here in the suburbs than in the city, just like the houses. Give the little bastard this. He was persistent. 
I swatted him with my hand first. He returned, closer this time. I jabbed back at him with my book of poems. His translucent wings fluttered at me and I lost sight of him. I thought I had won. Later, washing off the sticky summer sweat, I noticed the red welts on my ankles, trailing down my arms. I fought, but he fought harder. We have a couple more here. Uh, so this one is called eggplant, and also kind of about my grandmother, and uh, about cooking. Eggplant. Nature's sensuality lives in the eggplant whose fluid curves remind me of my own shape. I noticed this while pre preparing melanzana and la parmigiana, eggplant farm, in the fading fall twilight. I gently peel away their aubergine skin, as thin as a chemise. I drop them in the oil with a dinner fork, where they dance a tarantella of fear and desire. The heat from the flame frizzes my hair, and I think about my grandmother and the generations of other Italian women frying eggplant for Sunday dinner. We share the same stance, the same white hips, the same recipes. We, who take ourselves away from everyday concerns to learn the secrets of the egg. Thank you. All right, so this is another older poem. Um, I remember this years ago when I was still in school. Um, this is written after Sherman Alexi. Um, it borrows the structure of one of his poems, but I, I love Sherman's work. And, his fiction and his poetry too. So this is a poem called 21st Century Rant on Melancholy after Sherman Alexi. I open a window. This guy I know gets panic attacks every time he thinks about the thousands of dollars he owes in student loans. And the old lady down the block dies of a heart attack because she can't afford both her medications and her groceries on her meager social security check and thinks starvation's not a way she'd like to die. And the young mother cries because she has four mother mouths to feed on her own, and employers don't pay people who haven't finished high school. And a kid acts out at school because he's tired of being made fun of by the other kids. And the young man screams as another of his friends is shot by the police for no other reason than the color of his skin. And a homeless man laughs because he had a PhD in economics, and because of a few powerful rich people, his world is going to shit. And this girl screams when she realizes her opiate addict brother has stolen all of her cash and credit cards. And this other girl cries when she holds her leg up to the mirror of everyone else's on Facebook and finds it lacking. And this is my father, who worked his bones on the dock unloading ships to end up disabled by his company's negligence. And this is my grandmother, who did without food and the English language, only to be abandoned by her brood of five Americanized children. I call inside the storm. This is the last poem I will read, um, and this one is not what I've been credit for either, but um, this is a poem by my work Jody that I've really been enjoying recently. I'm trying to memorize it, it's not really working. Uh, this poem is Mark Doty's At the Gym. This salt-stained spot marks the place where men lay down their heads back to the bench and hoist nothing that need be lifted, but some burden they've chosen this time. More reps, more weight, the upward shove of it leaving, collectively, this sign of where we've been. Shroud stain, negative, flushed onto the vinyl, where we push something unyielding skyward, gaining some power, at least over flesh, which goes with desire and terrifies with frailty. Who could say who's added his heat to the nimbus of our intent? Here, where we make ourselves something difficult, lifted, pressed, or curled. Power over beauty. Power over power. Though there's something more tender beneath our vanity, our will to become objects of desire. We sweat the mark of our presence onto the cloth. Here is some halo of living made together. Thank you.